Reverend Phillips, thank you so much for coming and sharing. No matter how painful, we really appreciate that you could do that and share memories of your family with us. Thank you so much. My colleagues has just about asked the questions I wanted to ask. But um, I have a question here. You feel strongly that your brother Robert was targeted by the government at the time. You said they tilled him for years and years. They picked him up to put him in jail and what have you. Who do you think were those in the government, mainly at a hierarchy level, who would have wanted your brother killed? <laughs> do I want my brother killed? That was the, obvious. The late President Samuel Dole? Yes. Okay. This is a follow-up question. Commissioner Stewart asked about the incident at his house that led to his murder. And uh, he asked about who might have opened the door, I mean, who might have probably lured him to open the door or who stepped the door. Now, my follow-up question is, how many of them you think were there besides this other young man who you mentioned um, later, who was later killed, you said, around the post office? Who were some of those that no, no, you think no. might, might have uh, gone? Correction. Mm -hmm. The fellow that I said I heard was killed around the post office. Mm -hmm. I was telling him, I said, I remember during the incident with my mother, mm -hmm. this boy named Flecko, mm -hmm. who was a nephew of Zilli. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. He used to live right on Cheesman Avenue at that uh, house opposite the hotel. Mm -hmm. Okay? He was a friend of, you know, everybody in the yard. Mm -hmm. And that night he did come to the yard. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that after a while we lost track of him. But I was told that the fellow that they killed, if you remember, there was some fellow that they killed with some money business near the old post office here. Mm -hmm. On, uh, what's this thing? No, they're not Randa Street. Like Randa Street, Randa area. Okay? Yeah, it's Randa area. I understand my daughter was telling me that someone had told her that it was this boy. But this boy had nothing to do with, you know, this, the question you asked. Okay. That was what I was referring to. Okay, thanks for that clarification. But um, who were some of those who you think might have gone to the house that night and were part of the uh, slaying of your brother? Well, like I said, one thing is certain is it was army personnel because, like I said, I saw gun, you know, bullets. Okay, I saw the boot in there. And then we found out later on that the boy, apparently he, looked like he told his brothers or something, and that they had gone there earlier that night. But Robert was at a place called the clubhouse. Okay, there were a group of them sitting down there. Uh, the copas, you know, they used to go there. It's, it's on F.E. Shortcut Road, you know, before you take the F.E. Shortcut. Mm -hmm. No, it's on the right-hand side. You know, they had a place there called the club, the clubhouse. And apparently Robert was there. And we understand that when the soldiers came that night and found out Robert wasn't there, apparently they told the boy, don't say anything. Apparently Lula, they threatened him, don't say anything. So when he came home, when Robert came home, the boy never said anything. And then apparently the boy left. And when he left, you know, that's when this incident happened with Robert. And when we asked him later on, what, you know, but where were you? He said, Robert sent him to go buy tonic water. Mm -hmm. You know? But then, you know, at the time, it, like I say, it didn't click. Robert didn't really drink tonic water. Robert drank mostly orange Fanta. And it was not that after, like I said, when, you know, we're moving the things out and the, the carpenter, you're packing just things and packing things. And I said, you know, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about, you know, papers. Mm -hmm. But he packed the soft drink and carried it to my house anyway. And we were sitting down, Georgia Cassell, Wadi, Bright Dennis, you know, we're sitting at my mother's house talking about this thing here. And then they said, but wait a minute. Why tonic water? Because Robert didn't drink tonic water. Robert drank orange Fanta and whatnot. And then I remembered 
Then I went to my house to see the soft drink that the boy had, you know, the, 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 the people had brought from my brother's house. And there was tonic water, there was ginger ale, there was orange Fanta, everything, all soft drink was in there. That's when we realized that, you know, we were saying that he knew the poor, the people had come there before. He never warned my brother. It has also been rumored that there was a car parked outside his, his house or close by his house. Did you hear anything about the car or you know anything about the car? Do you know? I heard, I heard there was a car parked, you know, um, where the, where the embassy, the Libyan embassy, where the Libyan embassy is now. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's on, it takes up um, 14, it's on 14th Street, it takes up Payne Avenue and the other avenue. Mm -hmm. Okay, there used to be a restaurant there, a greenhouse, I don't remember the name of it, but it used to be a restaurant there. And I understand later on we're told that there were cars parked up in that area and cars parked further down. So when Robert came, he never really noticed that the cars were there, but we did hear that cars were parked there. Were you able to get any information on the cars, what kind of cars they were, what plates, whether they were government plates or no. private plates? No. Okay. Well, we're told that, you know, later on they said, that, like I say, they say I'm a person there, you know, but uh, as far as recognizing the vehicles and whatnot, I have no knowledge of it. Okay. Um, I'm not too sure of the exact date, but I do remember, because I heard it on the radio, following the, the killing of your brother, the late president made a statement, the late president do, made a statement about what had happened and he said <laughs> that your brother was allegedly storing army uniforms and communication equipment in his house that should have been used by the rebels. Uh, can you clarify this? Uh, if you remember, I said earlier where Do came on, you know my brother was, a, uh, Harvey was photography. He had the lens, you know, where he wanted the long lens, extended lens. And I remember my brother reminded me, because like I said, I spoke to him yesterday before, you know, coming here yesterday, I spoke to him, and he was telling me, he said, says, Roberta, he said, uh, remember to got up and said that Robert was using that lens mm -hmm. to put on the gun to shoot him. I said it here earlier. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so there was no such thing as he storing military uniforms in? Of course in not. Okay, I just wanted you to make yeah. a clarification. You spoke about um, Tilly and said he was active in, the, um, in your neighborhood, but you also spoke about the Greens and you spoke about the home of the Watkins. Is it Mr. Richelieu Watkins? It's Richelieu Watkins' house. Okay. He, was, he was out of the country. Okay. And, uh, and that's where the Greens were also yes. seeking refuge? Yes. Okay. And is it the same family of the student, Archie Green, who was on Cottondon? Uh, uh, what's what, what's it? What, what's what's uh, because he was also you know, you know, Green. Uh, what's her name, man? Uh, she's a wife for. Is that the family of Kim Green? Kim Green. Okay, that's so that's Green, so yes. that's the same family yes. because Kim, Kim is she's a wife with LEC. LEC, yeah. Yes. Kim is the oldest daughter. Yes. Okay, so it was in that incident that the son Achi also got killed. Yes. Because we heard about it as yes. well. Yes. Okay. So Kim Green's uh, 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 family, and she was working at LEC at the time. Right. Yeah. It was also rumored that. When they took the Greens away, they also took a foster son of Mr. Watkins, uh, one James Kanga. Is that true? Oh, yes. I remember there was an extra person that was taken. I think that's, yes. I think, that, yes. Okay. okay. I, think he was, I think he was mining the house or something. Yes, he was, I, yes. Caring, he was taking care yes. of the house. Okay, now that you mention it, yes. Okay, so he also got killed in that. He was also taken away. Yes, because okay. Tele moved into the house. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. We heard about it, but just wanted to clarify. Hmm. Okay. And uh, during that time, 
there was reportedly a death squad that was terrorizing Singer at a time, or the various areas of Singer, including the air fuel. Did you hear about this death squad, and who did you hear might have been commanding the death squad, or was leading these soldiers around who were allegedly killing people in the Singer area? Yes, we did hear about the death squad. We did hear about it, and there was some uh, maroon-like jeep that was, you know, associated with it. You were on one of those. Uh, something like a 50 caliber, you know, you know, one of those beautiful jeeps, maroon one, you know. In fact, uh, where they where they have uh, where they have 14th Street and Coleman Avenue, right by the Duke Big uh, uh, Apartments, right over there they had a tree. Okay, I don't know if the tree is there now, but that's where I know they had a checkpoint. The soldiers had their own checkpoints. Okay, those little petty soldiers had their own checkpoints mm -hmm. over over there. But we did know, we did hear about the death squad being in Singapore. Okay, but you didn't see the alleged death squad. We jeep. just saw jeeps going up and down. Oh, there were jeeps, not one yeah. jeep. Okay. You know, I saw jeeps going up and down. The only death squad that I knew was the one that came to my mother's house and killed my mother, and the ones that were staying across in Mark Richards' building. Okay, and and this is the one that you are alleging Tilly of. Yes. Um, the soldiers at the checkpoint, did you guys, were you able at any time to put a name to their faces? No. Do you know any of like, them? Like which I said, they? they were just petty soldiers who were trying to collect, you know, things and whatnot. You know, just trying to collect people's properties. Right over there, that's all. You know, two of them sitting down there, you bring your bag of greens, they take it from you. you no, know, that kind of petty things, you know. You spoke about your brother Robert extensively, but you also mentioned that you had a brother in the army, Lance Phillips, who yes. was a pilot. Yes. What was happening to him at this time? Was he also being harassed, being uh, an army personnel, having his brother constantly harass um, his, you know, members of his family killed? Was, well, he, was he safe? What did he also had experiences of harassment or intimidation? Well, uh, I remember, like I said, Lamb was in the army. You know, he had learned how to fly under Arthur Bedell. Okay, so he was in the army. And at the time, he was flying for Krinka. Um, Which was Airlines, okay? And I remember, uh, like, like I say, uh, Lamb reminded me yesterday that they were accusing him of being on one party and rather being on another party and then exchanging information. You know, he told me that yesterday when I spoke to him. And uh, in fact, when I called him, he said, but sister brother, he, you know, he said, if he had called me earlier to tell me you were going, I would have been able to give you, you know, more information, you know, because I called him on his job to ask him a question. And uh, I wanted just to make sure the date that uh, my father was, you know, was killed and who was there. And he, you know, confirmed the 22nd of October and he confirmed that, you know, Mr. Rainsbury was there. And my father said to him, you know, take me to the hospital. Well, he fell out, yeah. Your daughter who was taken away uh, with your mother and also killed, how old was she? She was 16. She had just celebrated her 16th birthday on the 15th of January, 1990. She, was, she would have graduated from, from uh, CWA that academic year. Did you have, did your family have twin girls with yes. them? Is she one of the twin? Yes, yeah, she was one of the she twin. She was one of the twin. The other twin was here yesterday with me. Okay, I did hear the story about yes. the twin girls. The other one, the, one, the other twin was here with me yesterday when she came. Okay, and like how, I said, how is she dealing with her grief? Well, she's trying. Uh, like I said, what happened later on, I took the rest of them to Ghana and they stayed there for years, went to school, everything else. And then a few years ago, I brought them back home and uh, she did the nursing program in uh, UMU, okay? She's working now as a nurse. She has a nursing degree. And um, she's going, apparently they need four more courses to get the bachelor's. But they gave them a you know A degree, so she's coming to do that. But she was here yesterday. Okay. 
when you spoke of the incident involving the um, complaint of threat to your life that you took to the Justice Ministry, mm -hmm. you spoke very passionately about how you feel the government is not doing anything to protect your rights as a person, as a citizen of Liberia. Um, apart from that incident that is obtaining, how do you feel generally? Is, do you, is there any hope for us as a people? Are you hopeful for the future of this country, considering everything that you've been through? Like I said earlier, we need to do something about law and order in this country here. First of all, the courts, this case here with this man who has threatened my life should never have reached this case. Because, like I said, if the court has sent for me and I didn't show up, they're going to be having a whole lot of people at my house to drag me almost in. But I paid twice for them to go pan transportation for that woman to come, and she never came. They never they said, Revy, where the, the woman didn't come. You know, Revy, the woman didn't come. The point about it is here, people don't care, okay? Anybody can do anything. If I go now and sit on your property, eh, they will have me up in a minute. But somebody comes, she, the woman asks me, what's somebody like me coming from the own that kind of property? She coming from, she says she comes from Nimba. I come from, she, what, what's someone like me come to own that property? What deed does she have for that property? Eh? What deed does she have for that property? I got my documents, but nobody wants to be bothered. Nobody wants to be bothered. This is, this, this is what is happening. We're selective in what we do, number one. And, you know, you know, I, 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 I have an incident here. I don't want to prejudice. No, let me leave it because I'll be prejudicing, prejudicing, um, prejudicing somebody's case here. But something happened to me over a year ago. Somebody knocked my car. What are your omnibus knocked my car? April 6th last year, I was on my way to Good Friday service. His driver came, swept around my car, knocked my car. We took the car to, the, went to, to, to Center Street Prison. I mean, and, 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 and Center Street, where they had the, the, the police station. Okay? First of all, the man didn't have a license. Secondly, he was driving an NTL, NTL G plate, which was long outdated. Okay? He had nothing. He was going, but I had my license, everything else. The next time when I went back to, 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 to uh, I think it was the next year or that Monday, when I went back to, to the place to go find out where this place was, I mean, where were the people? The, I was told a police had come and taken the man from there and carried him to Central, okay? The number that I had for your honorable man, when I called it, he told me, he said, oh, you know, I'm going on, my wife is at the point of death. I'm on my way to Nigeria. Yet me thinking that the man is actually on his way to Nigeria because his wife is in Nigeria. After a few days, I called the number again. They said, oh no, the senator went to go witness the, 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 the elections in Nigeria. Okay? From last year, I have gotten nothing out of it. Up and down, up and down. The other day, just before the incident up with, you had with all the people who were killed up there, the police called him on the telephone. He said, oh, I'm coming down tomorrow. I will get in touch with Brevin Phillips. Bingo, nothing happened. Nothing happened. You hear me? And who was it? You have my documents here. You have my documents. Your Honorable Roland Kine. You have my documents. You have the paper from the police where they signed, where he, the people who, who were in his car signed. Over a year, I couldn't get my car fixed. And then when I went to the police station, when I called on the telephone, soon they recognized my voice. They would switch the telephone to somebody else. These are some of the things that I'm afraid of. Okay, um, thank you very much, Reverend Phillips, and thank you so much for sharing with us and also for sharing with us your thoughts on Liberia, the hope and future for Liberia. Hopefully, all of us as a people can really, really be serious about this country and do something about addressing the culture of impunity and just respecting people's rights. You know, everybody belong here. We need to learn that, and we need to learn that all of us have rights. So thank you so much.
Yeah. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much for um, coming to share your experience with us. And also we want to express sympathy for the death of your relatives um, during our period on a review. Um, your statement today brings to mind uh, some of the things that can happen to people, even by associating with people who people feel uh, are not supposed to be part of society. And so we take that uh, serious, we take that into serious consideration, and we want to say thank you for bringing this up, because most of the time people find themselves in this situation and they don't know what to do. So we want to say thank you for bringing that aspect up. Um, I have a few questions, and one of them is um, those you name that were taken away by Tele. You said before um, he went to your mother's house, he went to other neighbors. Hmm. One of them was this green, me green. He took away her, her son, and her husband. My colleague asked you whether it was Archie, Archie Green. And he said, yeah, the son was Archie Green. But then who was her husband? We didn't get her name. And the reason why I'm asking this question is, is that we are, asked, we are mandated to also uh, do a listing of all of those who died during the period under review. This is the reason why I'm asking. He used to work at uh, Telecom, Sam Green. He used to work at Sam. Yeah, he used to work at Telecom. Samuel Green used to work at Telecom. Okay, then you also talk about Solo Pepe. Yes. Um, and six members of his family who were also taken away and killed. Um, do you remember any of their names? All I remember was Solo Pepe. I remember his wife was there. I remember that his, his, his mother-in-law was an aged woman. You know, late 80s, you know, somewhere, you know, in that, that area. They had apparently some children there. And then there was a boy. There was a, a young boy who, who was uh, living in the house. I don't know anybody the names. Like I say, uh, Solo Pepe, I mean, no Solo Pepe from childhood at Solo Pepe. I don't even remember. All those years, I never remember his, his real name. Okay. And then finally, at home with your mother, your uncle was killed, your cousin was killed, you name all of those, and then you name your daughter, but then the three children who were also killed. The little girl name was Margo. Margo? Ma Ma the little girl name was Margo, and uh, just a minute. I will tell you, I'm sure I got it written down. The little girl name was Margo. She was a young little girl, right up, almost around the, the, the age of my, of my daughter. We asked her another question, I will find the name. Um, the last one is, were you uh, able to bury them? No, at one time I was told that the bodies were on 16th Street. Uh -huh. And later on, when Bishop Brown came down to Morovia, uh, I asked him if, if I could get the bodies, if I could bury them in the church's yard, you know, the 15th Street yard, until a later date when I could move it. But immediately before then, uh, when I asked about my mother's bodies and if they could just bury them, I was told by the neighbors in the area that anybody caught going around those bodies, that's what I was told, that they would be considered rebels. So we just left it. I never did any more search on it, you know? Okay. So I could never confirm really the bodies because by the time I could get back to 16th Street, to really, you know, after the war had subsided and everything else, I could not, you know, verify it, so I just left it up to that. Okay. 
had a little lost name down here. <coughs> if you can't find it, you can give it to us later on. Yeah. If you can. My 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 children will will, will will know the names. Okay. Yeah. We can get it later on. I remember the local name was Marco. Okay. Okay, and finally, is um, did you ever do any memorial or so for them? Well, I had, uh, luckily for me, my brother, we had a funeral at the Catholic Church on the 8th of January. He died on the 4th, and uh, we had the funeral on the 8th. And the reason why we rushed it, because my mother was telling me that what we could do is we could go to Stryker, let bring the body here to the house, you know, and let Rabba be here. And then I told uh, Cousin Bandit, I said, if we bring that body to the house, Mama will not let it go. She will not let it go. And we waited, and the only reason we waited that late because at the time, my cousin, Sophie, Sophie uh, Brewer, Sophie Brewer, and my other cousin, Ethel Payne, Ethel Barclay Payne, when they got the news, immediately they took a flight to come home for it. So that's why we waited until the 8th. And after they came home, Sophie Brewer and uh, Ethel, we buried the body on the 8th of, of uh, January. And then for your parents, no memorial for your mother and the other people? My mother, after several years, after several years, okay, after a few years, uh, we had, I had a memorial service at uh, St. Stephen's uh, Church. At the time, Father Bright was there. And I had a ring. And my mother, you know, my mother had always told me the day she died, I should mourn for her. Nobody should make me wear black. And I used to say, she used to say, anything you put your hands on in the closet, we use it. And I used to say, she said, put on red if you want to. And I said, no, I will wear blue. So after a couple of years, we had a memorial service at uh, St. Stephen's Church. I told everybody, wear blue, wear any color, and I wore blue with a white hat. Okay. And we had the memorial for her and the rest of them. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. I will get the other two names, the names of the boys, but the girl's name was Marco. Thank you very much, Reverend Phillips for taking your time to come to go back to explain your experience during the course of our conflict, though it is still painful. And I join my colleagues to say sorry, have my sympathy for what happened to you. I know you've gone through it for long. And you talk about your brother. When you were arrested the first time and you couldn't find him for a couple of days, but later on, you phoned him. But did you also mention at one point in time, he was arrested and chained in the pickup. Can you tell us why it happened that time? OK, the time that I was talking about, the first time when I said that we couldn't find Robert, mm -hmm. the night his wife called me and told me that uh, Robert had not come home, and it was not like him to be out of the house that time of the night. Like I explained, it was. Uh, he was kidnapped. He was kidnapped. You know, he used to go, you know, a lot of us go out to, to, what do you call it, Hotel Africa at the time. You know, they have gambling and things like that. And Robert used to go there, you know, on and off. And I think it was coming from the place. I, I never did go into where, you know, where it happened. All I know is that he was taken. And like I said, I searched for him until about 4 o'clock that morning. Then when I went to my father and I told my father what had happened. Cause we went to the police station in, in Sinko, you know, Congo Town area. We went to the police station across, you know, went to the police station that was, you know, here at the time. Okay, not this, of course, not this building or whatnot. And um, we found out, I couldn't find him. I went to my father 
and they will send my brother, Land, the youngest one, okay? We sent him, and he found rubber in, in BTC. There's a place on the left-hand side. That's where rubber was. But by the time Land could come back and tell us, they had moved him from there, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the second time that I'm talking about rubber being handcuffed in the pickup was when we decided to let's it was 19, uh, November, November 12th, we said. Right, November 12th, when we decided that we were going to turn him in because, like I told my mother, and you know, it was funny. What I was running from to happen to my brother happened to her. And I said to her, I said, Ma, at least we'll be able to find Robert, you know, we're able, to, we're able to find Robert's body. But suppose we had not turned him in, okay? And it was that day when we turned him in. And Edward Massacre and that group carried Robert from us. The next thing we knew, like I said, we were coming down to bring uh, uh, food and whatnot and clothes and slippers and things like that, you know. When we got to Capital Bypass, they passed us. Uh, when you're coming to Sinkor era, it was, okay, you know the new police station is, okay? It was coming, Little Brown area. When we were going in town, and they were coming this way, and they would notice that Robert was in the pickup, and he was handcuffed. You know, they had that grill on the, on, the, on the cab of the pickup. There's a grill. And he was handcuffed there in his shorts and in his, his uh, singlet. And later on, we found out that he was in his socks. He didn't have any shoes. And when we got, we, we turned it, I turned around, and we, they took him to Old Road. They had a place around Old Road area, okay, where uh, some security office ran there. And that's where they took him. When they took him there, and then I asked if I could give him the slippers. And then he took off the socks, and he put on the slippers. And I remember very well the trousers we carried. They said they were long trousers. He couldn't use it. And I remember asking for a razor blade. And I cut the legs and made a short trousers. And he put it on. So, so there were two different incidents. Yeah, so then what was his charge for the second time? The second time was a treason uh, 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 thing, November 12th. The, the yeah. first time Robert was kidnapped, as I say, it was in the early 80s. Yes. Okay? That's what I told you, I said, the Herman Green situation and whatnot and Penno. Okay, that's a different situation. This time here that we turned rubber in was when they were looking for rubber for November 12th. Okay, that's when they took rubber and uh, uh, Jim Holler and, and the president, that's when they locked them up. That's a different uh, situation. Oh. And it was because they were looking for rubber and we decided to turn rubber in rather than have them go kill him somewhere, on the, you know, and say that whatever happened. So we turned him in alive. And when we turn him in and they carry him, Edward Massacre was one of those who carry him. And like I say, we were carrying the things down to him, like clothes and whatnot. They were coming up, uh, Capital Bypass. And when we saw him, we turned around and then went to Old Road. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a security place on Old Road. And I know the NSA, there's, there's, you know, Something, yeah, okay. They yeah, carry him. Had you know. any relationship with Kuangpa? Was he his friend or what? Was it linked to Kuangpa or so? I think, I think they were all linked to Kuangpa. I think they were all linked to Kuangpa because it was November 12th. I think they were all linked to the Kuangpa. But later on, he was released. He was released in June. Okay. Yeah, either, either the 6th, 7th, or 8th of June, somewhere around that time, 1986. They had the trial. Yeah, they had a trial. February, mm -hmm. February, okay. 1986. That's when they moved Robert from Post Arcade and carried him to, to Central Prison, okay? And then they went through the trial for this period and whatnot. And then, like I said, all of a sudden, we were carrying food that day, and we found out that they had been released, and they had them in a big truck. And they said they didn't want to put them down anywhere. They were carrying them around, you know, to put them in a, a, in a, in a safe place where they could get down. And I remember distinctly, we stopped the truck, we followed the truck. 
And right here at Diana's, I stopped the truck. And that's where Robert, got, we told him to put him down. That's where Robert got down. My mother was in the car with me, and he got in the car, and we went to, to my mother's house. Thank you very much. So after the trial, he was released because there was no, you know, no. They, were, they, were, they said they were, they were found guilty and of treason and all of that thing and whatnot. And like I say, all of a sudden, June, the first week in June, all of a sudden we just got up and found out that they had been released. Clemency. No, clemency. Mm. Okay, thank you. And then you talk about that morning when you went to your brother's house. Mm. You said we actually trying to open the door and then they enter. You didn't see any bullet wound on the wall. No. But you said, I don't know, maybe you can clarify this. You saw a gunshot. Mm -hmm. Was it in Robert House? Yes. I, it, like I said, what happened? It must have dropped off. Okay. It must have dropped off their belts or something. Mm -hmm. But it was, was not fired. Okay. And the, the, the bullet I'm talking, the bullets I'm talking about. Oh, sorry. The bullet I'm talking about is like a pencil. You know, in sharp my pencil. I don't know what they call that type of bullet. It's about this long. But it's very thin. Okay, so you saw a couple of that in the Yes. House. Thank you very much, um, Phillips. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. Thank you. Reverend Phillips, um, Commissioner Pearl Brown Bull. I want to say thank you very much for taking the courage to come to inform us and the Liberian public of what has happened to this family ranging from 1955. Cover the period for which the TRC is supposed to look into violations according to our act because they say when anyone makes an application for time preceding 1979, the TRC is mandated to look through. Because we've heard one side of the story and the best evidence is always the one. Well, we're supposed to go to 2003, but the same TRC act gives us the authority to make recommendations to the head of state to the government of the Republic of Liberia for institutional changes. And specifically in the act, they talk about the need, and that is Article 7, Section 26. My reference is J. I to make for legal institutional and other reforms. The TRC Act goes out of the comprehensive peace accord in which they talk about the 1986 Constitution of Liberia as well as the international charters for which Liberia has ratified. I refer to our Constitution of Liberia which says uh, Article 20, all, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, security of the person, their property, privilege or otherwise, except the outcome of a hearing or judgment in the court in accordance with due process of law. I'm referring to your property where the proper place to go is the courthouse but also for due property, for your life and liberty. The same constitution say every person shall have the right to own property. And Article 24 talks about the inviolability of private property shall be guaranteed by the Republic of Liberia. So we are happy today, that's why I got up to see whether the radio and the TV was on, that Whatever you said, others will hear it because you're speaking, sitting in a seat, and speaking for so many who don't have the opportunity 
for people to know what's going on to them. And that we hope this family, that this vicious cycle, you said also that the responsibility, you throw the responsibility on the government. Yes. For the death of your grandfather, your father, your father, yes. your brother, your yes. mother, your children, and yes. your relatives. Yes. The TRC Act says that we should investigate and identify where possible persons and authority involved in such violations. So you have come and you have identified the Republic of Liberia, the government officials doing within those periods of time as those uh, who have violated uh, your family's rights under the law. The TRC also afford us the uh, responsibility on Article 7, Section 26F, to help restore the dignity of victims in order for us to have reconciliation. So, lastly, the same article, because what I want to refer to, why we will do what and what you said. Article 7, Section 26, gives the TRC the right to make recommendation for the need to hold prosecution in particular cases where the TRC deem fit. So we are to recommend amnesty where we deem fit. And although there's a position that if people have done certain violations, they should not be excluded. They should not be granted amnesty. We want to know you have come and you have asked. It's like a plea for what a petitioner petition. You have petitioned to us that you want justice. So under the laws that I've cited, I'm sure the TRC will take note to your recommendation and your request because we are to provide an environment where victims and perpetrators will come to give a clear picture of what happened. In saying that, I've listened to you, but my research has taken me back. And you say that, uh, you say the Lord's Prayer. My research have taken me back, picked me back to June 23rd, 1955, when your grandfather house was taken a place with 17 persons in there who had to walk outside. And I recall, uh, this, the, my research says that Ms. Genevieve Garnett, Genevieve Coma, who's now Genevieve Garnett, she was one of those. And she also had the opportunity to have hear some of the last words of your, fa your grandfather during the treason trial. At least I, my research has taken me there was a treason trial. It also takes me, and this is what I want to say to you, not much questions, to your grandmother, who they call Mama Dor, in which when the circumstances and the situation were going on, and the house was set a fire and 17 persons in it, and they were coming out, she asked the question, God, are you dead? Are you deaf? Are you dumb? You cannot see? You cannot hear? And the voice came from one of the family members. He can see and he can hear. So I want you to take solace in that fact, I'm sure, that God has seen, God has heard, and he knows all what's best. And just as you said, if your, you or your mother had died, blood stain would have been on the hand of your brother because he surely would have gone after you all. But because God sees and he hears, most of those that you can live today to give us the history of some of those who are still alive and to clear some of the myth, the lies, the rumors and also to substantiate some of the truth on what occurred within the period 1955 to 1990 when they buried your little brother Robert Philip January 8, 
1990. Some of us recall the incident. So it just substantiates this. But I want also my research to say what your grandfather said to Miss Genevieve Garnett, Reverend Garnett, because she's still alive. I don't think she's in the Republic of Liberia. But I think what she said during the treason trial, she saw Papa, and he said to her, quote, Jen, we will not make it, unquote. But he cited Nathan Hill, one of the writers of those days. And they quoted, I only regret that I have but one life to give to my country. But if I die, I'm confident that none of you will suffer because I have done nothing to cause a curse on you all. And I want you to go and take care of the family. And God will bless you because you have your presence of mind. Your head and direct has directed us. Tell the children, and I assume they were you all too because you all were the children. They should not bother about our lives. Because I know that if we do not do the right thing, generations unborn will suffer. That is what it is leading to. But God will take care of you all. So I hope that the vicious cycle that has empowered this, engulfed this family, that living with you, the only surviving heir of your mother, although she has several children, the tree is not dead until the last seed is dead. So we thank this seed for coming to give us the right story about the plot that failed, the book that was banned. Before I close, I want to say, like I always have said since the hearing of this TRC is starting, we may not have caused the war. We may not have participated in the war, but we all suffer from the war in some manner or form. What we all can do is contribute to the peace. And that is why one of your family members have been trying to do, to contribute to the peace and stability of this country. As we sit here today, we will not hear the voice of Rowan Jerakoma because he just passed his paper to us to say, that is my sister. And please excuse me. So as we sit here, I always say we represent the regional, the ethical, the political, the social, and all of the Liberian people. We too are humans. We ask you all to continue to pray that at least we'll continue to bring what the Liberian people really need because we too have experience some part we can empathize and sympathize and the TRC knowing that the act gave us the right to show compassion for the victims because you can only show compassion if you have experienced something you can find that complete passion I will write in article 7 section 26 I, victims shall be treated with compassion and respect for their dignity. I want to tell you, take courage. And to those outside, now in government, there was a time when you were outside of government, you had a microscopic eyes to see everything. And please, don't have an antenna that will be switched to a different station that you cannot hear the voices of those who you saw. I'm sure the Justice Ministry will hear that, and they will know that your case is not just a property case, but it's life. And if people have followed but Robert Phillips, perhaps you thought they were following him alone, but God was watching them, and others were watching to really know who really went in that house, and who really did the killing. So you have put your life and call on them 
that your life has been threatened and I'm citing that your voice has been heard and remember what your grandfather said God will take care of you and someone in your family say he hears he sees and he knows all take faith because you're a preacher and continue to say the 23rd Psalm and to all of us who are Christians and non-Christians because even if the 23rd Psalm is not in your religion there's a, there's a voice or there's some Psalms there that even as great or greater than the 23rd Psalm thank you for coming take courage and the voice that you said today will not fall on tawny grounds but will be part of our history thank you Thank you. Mr. Philip, we want to thank you for taking up your time to come before the TRC to explain what has taken place in your family. All that I wanted to know had been asked and all that I wanted to say has been said except one thing you and myself along with some along with some uh, Muslims and friends we have been working together to bring up a peace in this country but I never knew that these happenings were part of your history and our history so you are coming today to tell us what happened again reinforce our relationship so I want to tell you as a preach as a priest, you need not to be entreated by anyone. You have the Bible. And I know the more you read, yes. the more you understand why. Yes, that's true. My only advice to you is that you have a burning issue. And that is the threatening of your life concerning your property. He you said you have gone to the Minister of Justice and explained to the, uh, to the Solicitor General or somebody took your letter there and he said to you this is a land dispute but your emphasis is on threatening of life. Yes. And I think if you ask your lawyer he will tell you and there is provision in our, in our criminal law of 1972 that specifically address itself to what you are talking about. The charge is threatening of life. And if your lawyer can take the matter to court, put the machinery of the court into operation, and you prove your case, the accused will be placed under what is called peace bond so that he will not in any way or form do anything to harm you. Now, as a friend, as a colleague, that will be my advice to you. So please have our sympathy and continue to take courage we believed that God led you throughout. You were 11 years old when your grandfather incident took place. He led you. You decided to take ministry as your work. And today God has given you the courage and the opportunity to come and explain to the TRC that we add more records to what had been made before. So we said to you, 
please have our sympathy and take courage. Thank you very much. Once again, we say thank you for agreeing to come here today. Your testimony today has shown light on so many incidents that took place during the period under review that needed clarification. And you've come here today and for the past hours giving us clarification. And for that, we highly appreciate and we say thank you for all of that. We also want to join all of the other commissioners to encourage you to take heart that whatever you've said today that we've taken into serious consideration and the TRS will see how best we can all resolve and come up with that one single reconciliation that will bring final peace to our country. Thank you so much. Before you leave, is there any other thing you want to say to the TRC recommendations, anything that you think uh, may help the process or anything you want to see done, any any other thing that you have not said here today? No, basically I'm just hoping that you see things cannot continue to go and they're held. They go and they're held. Something has to be put down, something has to be stepped down. You know, there's a saying that parents have, when a child does something wrong, you slap it against the head. It's not that you don't love it, but you want to make sure that child goes in the right direction. I think your job should be where some of the instances you might not want to, you know, say something about it, but you have to, because we cannot continue to live as we are living without in some instances of fear, okay? Or in some instances where you feel you're not protected. Or in some instances where you feel anybody can do something to you and get away with you. But yet and still, if you do something, then the law is on you. It, this, this is where I find myself also, you see? I think these things need to be reviewed and where instances need be, I think steps need to be taken to rectify it. Because if not, we're going to continue to go hear the thing. Because, you see, one of the things I say, somebody say, oh, yeah, all right, I did it. Okay, never mind. So what now? What happened to you? And I say, I'm sorry. And they say, okay. But that's not it. Because there's, if people, there will be people who are saying, and I say, I'm sorry. So what now? Anything, anything, what happened? Nothing happened. Something has to happen. Something has to happen so to deter people from doing what they're doing that's not right. And as long as this government does not put their foot down to make, you have to make some drastic change so people know that this, this is a country, it's a nation. We're not going to be laughed at. We're not going to be seeing people doing things they want to do at their own will. Things must take place. I don't care who it is. It must happen. Just like you train your child in, in, in the home, this is how we must train ourselves in the country to make sure that we lead in the right direction. That's, that's my concern. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, you may go now. Thank you. Thank you very much.